So let's review the material and let's get into a substantive review on corporations too. Last semester we talked about how corporations are formed, some of the social consequences of that. We talked about corporate social responsibility as a way that led into, as you saw, the duties of agents and some of the uh, fiduciary issues that we dealt with this semester. Last semester we also dealt with authorization when a director can act for the company. And authorization is half, authority is half of the doctrine of agency. We then shifted this semester to deal with the doctrine of agency as it pertained to duties of agents. So not the authority, last semester, authority of agents, this semester, duty of agents. And then we leveraged the duty of agents concept into a discussion about the duties of directors. And we covered three major duties, the duty of care, the duty of oversight, the duty of loyalty. And then we shifted gears to the uh, I wouldn't say duties per se, but the liabilities of shareholders. So shareholders can be sued, it turns out, that last semester we learned about the beautiful limited liability company, the limited liability corporation, and how that facilitates investment, capital markets, etc. And then we learned this semester the limitations to that, sort of the mirror image to that principle. And again, those principles about not just corporate social responsibility, but some of those basics that we learned in first semester we should have seen how they were flipped and how a corporation, uh, an owner, could not get the benefit of limited liability when they were not using a corporation for those intended social purposes. And so we covered the doctrine of veil piercing and we focused on veil piercing as it pertains to corporate contracts, torts, and corporate groups. And then we wrapped up the semester with a, a few weeks on securities markets. And so we, I introduced you to securities markets, gave a brief overview of the 1933 Act, and the exemptions there too. And then we followed up with 10b-5, a discussion of the fraud claims in the 1934 Exchange Act. And so that covered uh, uh, the topics that are often visited, but also hopefully some topics that were interesting and, and helpful to you. So I'm going to dive into those with some detail. And if you brought it with you, uh, remember I gave you an outline. So I'm going to sort of fill in that outline in today's conversation. So I'll give you a minute. If you have it handy, you might want to pull it out and follow along because I, I, I'm going to uh, proceed in a linear format that mirrors that outline in order to facilitate your uh, ability to follow this. So we began with the duties of agents and while the duties of agents are usually not directly tested on the bar exam, they sometimes come up. These pertain to agents in many sorts of business organizations. These duties of agents include the duties of employees, can be the duties of partners, can be the duties of directors. And so it's important to be aware of these general principles. Again, they haven't been tested uh, in this kind of vein since about 2011 or 2010, uh, but, but they're helpful to keep in mind as we go forward. So there's a general fiduciary principle that an agent has a duty to act loyally for the principal's benefit in all matters concerned with the agency relationship. And so that broad principle in Restatement of Agency 3rd, Section 8.01, this general fiduciary principle is the backstop and sort of if you or maybe you'd say the cornerstone even uh, around which we build this whole edifice. And then we get more specific and, and as you'll see in your outline and as we've talked about in class, the uh, restatement then goes on to talk about how an agent cannot take a material benefit due to the position that they have and that has a parallel in corporate law with the fiduciary duty of loyalty not to usurp a corporate opportunity. See Guthrie Loft for example. Uh, the, the agent has a duty not to act on or behalf of an adverse party or to compete with the principal, has to use the principal's uh, uh, property only for the principal's purposes, so you can't use your employer's uh, laptop for your own purposes, ostensibly, at least uh, not to the extent they conflict. Uh, although, as we see, there is some limitations. A principal can consent to those sort of things, and that consent can be either implied or in fact. And so the principal might imply the fact that you might use your laptop to watch YouTube on the weekends. It's not necessarily uh, 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 barred. So in addition, uh, there is some general duties that, principal, that agents have to principals and some of that can be created by contracts. And often this is in the form of an employment agreement. The employment agreement is a contract which has both express and implied terms. And as I teach in contracts class, one of those terms is the duty of good faith and fair dealing. It's incumbent in all contracts. And so 
there is a duty of acting in good faith and fair dealing that the principal has, that the agent has to the principal. And moving on through the other aspects of the restatement, there's a duty of care, competence, and diligence. That should remind you of the business judgment rule. And we can think of our asleep at the switch director who is not exercising any care, much less reasonable care. Uh, and so the agency law does provide a, an illustration to that. And then we have a duty to act only within the scope of authority. And so that has a mirror to what we learned last semester where authorization of directors wa was discussed a duty of good conduct, uh, and a duty to provide information and to keep records. So that's all background material. It's something that you should keep in mind, be aware of, and be able to apply in other contexts. It comes up in employment law. It comes up in partnership law. It can come up in limited liability companies. But when we get to corporations, we have some additional doctrines that are fundamental. And the most fundamental of all of them is the business judgment rule. You must, must, must understand fully the business judgment rule in order to understand corporate laws that exist today. And the simplest statement of the business judgment rule is found in Delaware General Corporation Law, Section 141A, which reads, the business and affairs of every corporation organized under this chapter shall be managed by or under the direction of a board of directors. Now, it's a very general statement that the business affairs shall be managed under the direction of the board of directors, but it has been interpreted by courts over time to mean that directors have a huge amount of discretion in what they do on behalf of the corporation. And generally, what they do on behalf of the corporation will not be challenged so long as it is done, as we see, with some reasonable amount of care and confidence. So we read two major cases on this. The first was Schlensky versus Wrigley, kind of a fun old case about nighttime baseball that really teed off the issue. And that case was predominantly about a decision not to install uh, a lighting at the Cubs Stadium in Wrigleyville. And this actually tied back into our conversation on corporate social responsibility. There were some discussions about maintaining the values of property in the neighborhood. Similar to how Ford wanted people to have cheap automobiles. Uh, apparently, Wrigley wanted people to enjoy Wrigleyville his namesake, I guess, so there might have been some personal interest there, but he actually framed it much better. He basically said that the Cubs need people to feel comfortable coming to the stadium, which is in an inner city in an urban area, and maintaining property values is one way to maintain the, the population enjoying those games, and it was not uh, completely ridiculous. And so that was sort of the standard, the completely ridiculous standard, if you will, that was presented in Schlensky. The decision was not at odds with a business judgment, and the court there found that uh, uh, without a claim of fraud, illegality, or conflict of interest, a business judgment by a director will stand. And it turns out that the law does proceed farther than that, and we had a very lengthy discussion on the business judgment rule, which I invite you to look back at. I, I reviewed some scholarship, but, but let's fast forward to the case of Van Gorkum. And Van Gorkum was a class action case where some shareholders wanted rescission of a cash-out merger. So Jerome Van Gorkum was the CEO of TransUnion, and he entered into an agreement to, uh, to essentially sell the company to the Pritzkers. And the problem with this deal was it was done real quick. It was approved in a matter of hours. Um, it had a fairly decent valuation, 50% over market value, but the problem was that the, the board didn't really do the work of finding out what the value should have been. And so we learn here in the Van Gorkum case that the business judgment rule is not unlimited, not at least as unlimited as Slensky would lead us to believe or, or as it was at the time, even if there is no fraud, illegality, or conflict of interest. A director's business judgment is only protected by the duty of care when that decision is reached with paper and process. So paper and process became kind of a watchword in corporate work after this. And so we have things like attorneys standing by the board, watching them initial every single page of a merger agreement, presenting them with a lot more information, mandating that meetings are 48 hours instead of two hours, et cetera, et cetera. It's not entirely clear that this has uh, created better judgment making, but, uh, but it is important to remember the holding of Van Gorkum. And in this case, uh, Judge Horsey, uh, held that, one, the board's decision to approve a cash-out merger was not an informed business judgment. It wasn't informed because it happened too quick. They didn't have valuable information about how much the company was worth at the time. Now, you may remember that there was uh, a, a market test period which should have revealed information, but Horsey, Judge Justice Horsey uh, uh, found uh, 
that that was insufficient to give them information at the time the decision was made, and so we care about having information at the time the decision was made. Two, that uh, uh, the, the holding, uh, second holding was the board acted in a grossly negligent manner in approving the uh, amended merger proposal. So apparently uh, negligence is not enough, but gross negligence is. So we start to have some contour here that if a board acts with gross negligence, uh, they do not get the duty of care. And this was also important, the shareholders could have cleansed the transaction. How would a shareholder vote cleanse a transaction? Well, even if the board made a stupid decision, if the shareholders later decide it was a great idea, then that decision would not be uh, uh, creating liability for the directors. So why didn't that work here? There was a meeting, but at that meeting, the shareholders were not informed either. And so we do learn that an informed shareholder vote can cleanse a breach of the duty of care, can cleanse other things as well as we'll see, uh, but, uh, uh, but that was not sufficient here in the Van Gorkum case, which stood for the notion that a board must proceed with paper and process to enjoy the business judgment rule presumption. Now after the Van Gorkum case uh, and at the behest of the corporate bar, the Delaware legislature enacted DGCL section 102B7. And 102B7 uh, may put us back into a state of the world as if it was under Schlensky, not Van Gorkum. And the exculpation provision, as 102B7 is known, does that in the following way. It's a provision that eliminates uh, or at least limits the personal liability of a director for breach of a fiduciary duty of care for acts and omissions not in bad faith. And so actually, not in bad faith sounds a lot like not fraudulent, illegal, or conflicted. And so the standard then would be something less than Van Gorkum if a corporation has adopted a 102B7 exculpation provision. And from a technical standpoint, you should also be aware that that 102B7 provision, where does it go? It goes in the corporate charter. The certificate of incorporation in the case of a Delaware company will need to have an exculpation provision in it and 102B7 permits this exculpation. Now that's not the only way that a corporation can limit liability of its directors. And we discussed the reasons, the policy reasons, the financial reasons why it might be good to limit liability of directors. Let's talk about some other ways. The other main way is indemnification. And indemnification means stepping into the shoes of the director. And so um, uh, that would be uh, taking on their case, uh, providing counsel, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, and paying uh, for certain costs that uh, occur. And we have a couple different provisions. You should just be aware of which map to what. Section 104A authorizes indemnification in the case of class actions. We're going to get back to direct versus derivative, but a class action would be a direct lawsuit. So 145A of the GGCL authorizes indemnification in direct or class actions. And then 102, uh, 145B allows indemnification in derivative actions. Uh, 145C uh, uh, indemnifies expenses, uh, in addition to standing in the shoes, can indemnify expenses upon a success. These are all optional. You can adopt some, none, or all of these provisions. Corporations can pick and choose. Um, uh, 145D talks about the minimum standard of conduct for indemnification, uh, which again says that the director had to act in good faith. And so that good faith principle, if a director is acting in bad faith against the interests of the corporation, indemnification still does not apply, so it does not protect duty of loyalty breaches. Uh, when, a corporate, when, a, when a director is usurping a corporate opportunity. <clears throat> Section 145E, indemnification of expenses during action, is a bit contentious. This means that the corporation will pay for attorney's fees and other costs incurred while a suit is proceeding, meaning that the payments are made before a decision is rendered, and so the corporation may spend a lot of money protecting a director who turned out to be uh, negligent, grossly negligent, or, or acting wrongly. And so 145E gets some attention in the literature as being a problematic provision, but I don't have a problem with it because the shareholders can decide to have it or not. The stock value will go up or go down, and I think the market will sort that out. But that's my perspective on it. What's important to know is that 145E is what allows the cost to be paid during the course of the action as opposed to afterwards, advancing fees.
Uh, 145F simply says that indemnification is non exclusive, other protections apply, and then the other major uh, protection in addition to exculpation and indemnification is insurance. 145G uh, offer, uh, authorizes the purchase of director and officer insurance. And that can really be a game changer. It's very expensive, for one thing. But when it's useful, it means that the corporation is not paying itself. Because if a shareholder sues the corporation and the corporation indemnifies the director, then the corporation, the shareholders are paying for the litigation that they're proceeding with. And so it makes the litigation a lot less effective. It almost nullifies. So indemnification is an important way to protect directors, but we add then insurance in order for that, that funds to come not from the shareholders' own pockets. And so most major public corporations have adopted uh, uh, most of these and certainly indemnification. There's some interesting studies about whether adopting an exculpation provision increases or decreases the market value of a corporation, and uh, apparently it has very little effect. So that's the duty of care. Now, the duty of care has this mm, quasi-care, quasi-loyalty aspect to it called the duty of oversight. The duty of oversight, now, we, the duty of care has to do with actions, right? Or what I'll call commissions. And a deliberate action, if the board sits and meets and votes for a merger, they have to do it with paper and process. But what about the things a board fails to do? When can a director be liable for things a director did not do? for a failure to monitor, for a failure to pr provide for controls that would have ferreted out wrongdoing. And so the Caremark case was the seminal case here, which discussed this duty to ferret out wrongdoing. If we, if we reach back, I didn't even put in the outline, because in a way you should forget about it, because it's bad law. But Graham versus Alice Chalmers specifically said that there is no duty to ferret out wrongdoing. Well, that changed with the Caremark case. The Caremark case found that a corporation can be liable for failure to implement uh, uh, proper controls that will prevent, for example, employees from giving kickbacks and violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And so we see in the, in the case of Caremark that we have some amount of duty of oversight. And it's not clear whether failing it is a duty of care, failure, or duty of loyalty, failure. Caremark framed it as a duty of care. Others have tried to bring it into loyalty because it would be hard, it's very hard to win duty of care claims. Uh, but there is this duty to monitor the corporation and to set up these internal controls. And Sarbanes-Oxley then later came along. And Sarbanes-Oxley, or SOX, S-O-X, required statutorily many of these monitoring systems also. If you ask people in the, in the corporate academy whether Sarbanes-Oxley was good or bad, you'll certainly get mixed results on the topic. Uh, uh, generally, the opinion is it's at least better than Dodd-Frank. And it seems to have had some good provisions in there, which uh, at least some will say has created better housekeeping techniques, doing things you should have done anyway to provide for good governance. Uh, but anyway, Sarbanes-Oxley has to do with the duty of oversight because it has statutory mandates for specific types of oversight, specific monitoring, dashboards, protocols, whistleblowing procedures that have to be instituted by a firm. They have to have a hotline that you can call when you suspect a director of, of mis, misdeeds. <clears throat> um, then we talked about the case of, uh, of Stone uh, v. Ritter, where the shareholders bought a derivative action against a corporation and its directors, uh, alleging that they had failed to have a reasonable Bank Secrecy Act provision. So uh, AmSouth Bank, uh, located in the South, I guess, uh, uh, had, uh, had given uh, some accounts to a gentleman who ran a Ponzi scheme. And so the bank was liable for allowing a Ponzi scheme to be perpetrated right under its very nose using its banking system. Now, it is possible that monitoring systems would have detected use of a bank account for uh, a Ponzi scheme and saved the bank from liability. And so the shareholders sued and said that the monitoring system was, uh, was totally inadequate. But they kind of made a ridiculous claim that there was no monitoring system where, in fact, there was. I guess they have kind of had to. The board not only had instituted a monitoring system, but it was audited by an independent outside company who said it was pretty good. And you know what? It didn't work. But we're not going to apply 2020 hindsight bias to the directors of uh, decisions of directors in business judgment. That's simply not how the business judgment rule works. So Stone said, no, there's a limit to, sit, to, to Caremark. 
And here, the directors actually did implement a policy. And they had good reason to, they, they spent time, they got reports, they got an auditor. It actually was quite reasonable to think that the policy was pretty good. And so we're not going to hold the directors liable just because it turned out not to work. And then finally, we turn to Citigroup, which is a real creative claim. We're really getting off the deep end here. The financial crisis, everyone's suing everybody. And the shareholders are suing Citigroup because Citigroup has these toxic credit default swaps. I don't know if they're CDSs or CDO squareds or CDO cubed primes or some kind of crazy thing that guys with MIT physics degrees invent for financial services firms. But in any event, Citigroup had a lot of these assets which were not worth nearly what they were booked at. And Citigroup took huge billion dollar losses. And the shareholders sued and said, you should have been monitoring for the risk that these subprime loans would default. Well, OK, but. This is Citigroup's business. They're a lender. They lend money and they take risk on this. This is uh, the epitome of a business judgment. Citigroup was aware that the market was going badly. They decided to hold the asset, right? 50 50 hind, 50, uh, 20 20 hindsight, you know, it's hard to say what was the right move at the time. Obviously, after the fact, it's easy to say you sort of gotten rid of the toxic asset before it went to zero, sure. But but this was a business decision because the business of Citigroup is to hold risky assets like this. And so that was a business decision squarely within the business judgment rule. There was an exculpation clause. This was a total failure. But we did see in Citigroup that the duty of oversight was brought as a loyalty claim in part because a care claim would fail for the reasons we've discussed. Exculpation, indemnification, the difficulty of bringing it the duty the business judgment rule. So that then brings us to the duty of loyalty. And the duty of loyalty actually wins when it's true. Many times, shareholders will try to shoehorn a claim into a duty of loyalty claim because it's the only way to really win a case. What happens to the duty of loyalty? Well, the shareholder has to allege that a director stands on both sides of a transaction and, and therefore is conflicted. Now, conflicted is not necessarily bad faith or acting wrongly, but there are procedures that need to be applied when a director is, in fact, on both sides of a corporate transaction. And Delaware General Corporation Law 144A talks about this. It says that no conflict, no contract or transaction between a corporation, of one and, uh, between a corporation and one or more of its directors uh, shall be void or voidable uh, solely because the director uh, participates in the meeting which authorizes the transaction. So essentially saying, uh, uh, a transaction will not be void or voidable if, and this is the important if, so what are the procedures that have to be followed when a director is on both sides of a transaction? One, if the material facts as to the director or officer's relationship or ownership are disclosed and, so we have disclosure, right? So we have that knowledge, so kind of like business judgment rule, an informed decision-making process, the information is out there and the board or committee in good faith authorizes the transaction by an affirmative vote of who? Who? The disinterested directors. So the disinterested directors have to be aware of the conflict and approve it anyway. We're not going to listen to what the interested directors have to say about that. Uh, uh, or or we could also have the shareholders cleanse the transaction. Now, this is either or. We don't need both. We only need one cleansing mechanic. Either the shareholders or the directors can cleanse. And again, similar concept. If the material facts uh, as to the director of officer's relationship or interest and the contract or transaction are disclosed or are known to the shareholders entitled to vote, and it is approved in good faith by a vote of the stockholders. Now, one key thing here, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily make this clear, but which stockholders? Generally, we want a majority of the majority, or in other words, we want the disinterested shareholders to approve this transaction. And we saw this in the Remilliard Brick case, Remilliard Brick for Standini Co., the case that took place in California, where the court got it completely wrong, but uh, at least raised the, the critical issue of how stupid it would be if a 51% shareholder who was also a director could cleanse their own conflict transaction. So that can't possibly be the right result. And we need to understand that we're looking for a majority of the majority, or in other words, disinterested shareholder approval. Or three, and 
This is where, where angels fear to tread, the land of entire fairness. We don't want to go to the land of entire fairness because then courts get to decide if the transaction was good or not. But the third way that a transaction can be cleansed, if you will, if that's even a fair term, but it, it will be litigated, and then uh, and the court will decide if it is fair uh, at the time it was authorized. So we have three ways of cleansing a DCIT, the first being an approval by disinterested shareholders, sorry, disinterested directors, one, I mean, they all are true, but the first one that I mentioned was approval by disinterested directors who have the information. Yeah, and it has to have paper and process. Same paper and process applies because it's a business decision. Don't have paper and process doesn't count. Two, approved by the shareholders who have the information. Paper and process doesn't count. And three, uh, we go to the courts and we let the court of chancellery decide if it was entirely fair. Don't want to go there if you can avoid it. So this played out in Benihana. Very colorful cast of characters in this case. And Benihana was struggling. They needed to remodel their restaurants. And they were having trouble getting financing. But they had this guy on the board, Ito, and he had access to some money. He ran a fund. And so Ito's fund offered to buy Benihana stock. Uh, Mr. Benihana was ticked off because it would have diluted him out of a control position, but it saved the company. And the directors, I mean, he didn't approve it, but the rest of the directors who knew full well that Ito was on both sides approved it anyway, with eyes wide open after a lot of deliberation. So despite all the kicking and screaming that Mr. Benihana brought it all the way to the Supreme Court of Delaware on this one, he lost. He lost because the, this conflict of interest transaction was properly cleansed in Benihana. Um, <clears throat> we saw a couple other cases that also uh, uh, related to this. Uh, there was some conflict in, in Vogelstein where uh, shareholders sued the director of a corporation for giving a sweetheart plan to a departing CEO. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the directors moved to dismiss. And so uh, the, the shareholders uh, essentially uh, uh, there actually stated a, a claim for a breach of fiduciary duty because there was a conflict on both sides. And here the issue is not enough information was presented. Then we move on to Heizenga. And the Heizenga case, uh, uh, the board uh, uh, was also uh, conflicted. And so in this transaction, uh, the Chancellor Stride held that demand on the board was excused. Uh, because the majority of the board was uh, interested. And so asking the board to sue themselves uh, is, is unnecessary. And so actually this is a good time to talk about, uh, as we're going to, we'll bridge back to this as we get to derivative lawsuits, but only the directors of the corporation can decide what, what this corporation will sue, who the corporation will sue. It's a business decision, just like many decisions. And shareholders do not control the corporation, the directors do. So the directors decide whether the corporation sues X, Y, or Z. But what happens when the suit is about the directors themselves? Are directors going to sue themselves? Well, probably not. There are some <laughs> claims that they do if they're indemnified and exculpated and insured. So that's kind of interesting. And so those provisions actually make it even harder for a shareholder suit to get off the ground because the directors are no longer interested. But you're certainly interested in the results if you were to be sued. And so that conflicts you out. And so if you're conflicted, we have this other process where we're either going to set up a shareholder litigation committee or whether the demand is excused and the suit can proceed. And so that came up in Heizenga. Um, in DGCL section 122.17 makes it clear, however, that uh, a corporation shall have the power to uh, uh, renounce in its certificate of incorporation any interest or expectancy of the corporation uh, in a specified business opportunity or class of opportunities. So the corporation can uh, provide for uh, additional conflict of interest transactions. And this may be necessary in things like venture capital deals because a venture capitalist might get a seat on the board of a company, but is also the big source of the next funding. And so we certainly don't want to preclude that uh, Series A investor from being the Series B investor. And so there's good reasons to do this. Uh, and then we, le we ended with the, uh, the, the heart of the corporate opportunity doctrine, which was the case of Farber versus Servant Land Corporation. So what happened there? Some guys owned a golf course. And the land next door to the golf course. Now, what do golf courses need? Lots of land. I think it was about 100 acres to begin with. They had a chance to buy the adjoining 160 acres, go from an 18-hole to you know, two or three 18-hole courses. They had a real chance to expand. 
the golf course. And so uh, what happened here? Well, the directors presented this opportunity to the shareholders, but um, they presented it in a way which didn't give the shareholders really the proper information. Then they took the opportunity for themselves and later sold the entire parcel as one unit, thus showing it was clearly a corporate opportunity because someone wanted the whole thing. And so it actually had more value as a whole thing. The question was, did they get to keep the profits? No, they had to, they had to get rid of those profits in Farber because there was truly a corporate opportunity and um, there were uh, uh, three holdings there that the opportunity uh, uh, constituted a corporate opportunity and defendants breached their fiduciary duties by not presenting it to the corporation properly that the ratification that occurred later did not preclude the derivative suit because it didn't have sufficient information. Again, that information concept is fundamental. And that the corporation was entitled to the profits for the director's sale. As a result of the conflict of interested transaction, what is that? What the result then of a, of a DCIT that isn't cleansed is that the directors have to disgorge their profits. So that then does bring us to procedure, which preluded a little bit, as I was talking about in the uh, uh, Izenga case. Uh, and so we, we learned after, after we talked about the duties, we then moved back to talk about how these duties are enforced. And they're enforced either by a derivative or a direct lawsuit. And it really matters uh, which form you choose because your substantive rights and procedures are quite different. And so we first learned about the Thule two-step, right, which is a two-step uh, consideration as to whether or not this should be a derivative lawsuit. And it essentially goes down to one major factor, which is, well, the two factors are uh, uh, who is harmed and, and who would benefit. And so if the harm is to the corporation as a corporation, meaning to the corporation's bank account, to its ability to grow, to its, uh, its reputation, to something like that, and if the value of the lawsuit, if the, if the proceeds would go to the corporation as a corporation, it's a derivative lawsuit because it's the corporation's lawsuit. The directors have to issue that lawsuit. The directors control the corporation. But there are certain rights that are rights of the shareholders as shareholders. That has to do with their voting rights, their information rights, rights that they might have contractually as individuals. The voting right of a shareholder, if, if not enforced, might actually increase the value of a company. Maybe the shareholders are idiots, or maybe they're self-interested themselves. But they're entitled to those rights. And so a direct lawsuit is appropriate where the rights of shareholders as shareholders is what is violated. So if there's a derivative lawsuit, that means that the directors of the corporation have to institute and pursue that lawsuit. But when the lawsuit is about the directors suing themselves, clearly we have a conflict of interest. And so we have the doctrine of demand futility. And the Aronson case discussed demand futility and found that whether, uh, first off, uh, it went to Thule and said that whether stockholders' claims were direct or derivative turned on who suffered the harm and who had received the benefit. So it incorporated Thule, and I don't care if you cite Thule or Aronson or both for the general proposition. I like the Thule two-step as a sort of a, a you know a, a, a mnemonic device, and those two steps again, as repeated in Aronson, the issues are direct or derivative turn on whether who suffered the harm, who would receive the benefit of the recovery. So that's the two-step analysis, and that will tell you whether you're in the world of direct or derivative. Here, the stockholders did not have uh, a direct claim of money lost due to a delay in a merger. Uh, was, that had to do with the, the value of the corporation. And it once again disproved of something called special injury, which we didn't cover much because it's an old doctrine. We don't worry about that one. But uh, at least in the case of Aronson, we did find that uh, there was not a direct claim. It was a derivative claim because it, it really affected the value of the corporation, the corporation's ability to raise funding. Uh, even though it lowered the stock price, that's not what we talk about when we talk about rights of shareholders as shareholders. It was really that the corporation's value was lowered and the shareholders' entitlement to the value of the corporation was derivative. It wasn't about their voting rights. It wasn't about their information rights. In addition, we have this uh, other procedural element called a special litigation committee, which we saw come up in a couple other cases uh, as well, but was fundamentally addressed in the case of Einhorn versus Coolia. And what happened in that case? Well, a minority shareholder brought uh, a direct action against a majority shareholder and uh, an alleged breach of fiduciary duty, but was told, you know what, this is actually a derivative suit, went back, uh, repled as a derivative action, 
And uh, what happens in this case, so uh, if, uh, if a board is able to appoint an independent committee, the committee who is, if the committee is sufficiently independent from the board, the committee can decide whether or not the suit should proceed. Again, we want to try to give control to the board. So the problem is that the directors on this board will be liable. And so we're going to set up this committee, which is not those directors. And the committee, not the directors, will decide whether or not the suit proceeds. Uh, shareholders will make a structural bias argument. And this is my you know, constant uh, retort to the, these are all the same 67-year-old white men who play at the same golf club in Connecticut, et cetera, et cetera. And so there is an inherent structural bias, but that argument doesn't hold water. In fact, Martha Stewart, living Omni Media, made that case in a big way because Martha Stewart was not just playing golf with these people, but going to their birthday parties, their weddings, uh, had playdates with their kids, what have you, was making brownies with Snoop Dogg, and, and uh, even that was not enough to rise to the level uh, of, of the committee being uh, not independent. Although we saw in the case of Oracle, a case of a committee being not independent, and it wasn't about being buds, it had to do with Oracle funding Stanford and Stanford having a, a professor and the professor who had a chair, and it seemed a little attenuated, but it was enough in that case. So we have kind of cases on both sides that get us the idea that the Special Litigation Committee kind of acts instead of the board, uh, but the, the, that only functions properly when the Special Litigation Committee has sufficient independence. And so that brings us full circle then. So now we see that the duty of care, the duty of loyalty, the duty of oversight all pertain to when shareholders can sue directors. And the Thule two-step tells us how, how, shareholders, how shareholders can sue directors, whether it's one process or another process, the derivative process being by far the more common one because usually shareholders are suing not because they couldn't vote, uh, not because they were oppressed. Help, help, I'm being oppressed. Uh, but, but because the directors have caused the company to lose value, and losing value is something that harms the company as a company, and therefore the company is to sue the directors, that's a derivative lawsuit, and we have that special litigation committee process in place for that. So that's liability of directors. Let's shift then to liability of shareholders. And shareholders can be liable even though they have the protection of corporate limited liability under a doctrine called the alter ego doctrine, right? And that has to do with piercing the corporate veil. Corp piercing the corporate veil is kind of the big doctrine. The alter ego doctrine is when uh, a company is run uh, uh, essentially as the alter ego, a person is treating a company as their own personal piggy bank. And we learn that there are several factors that are frequently found uh, and found in this order uh, when uh, uh, piercing is appropriate. And they have to do with misrepresentation first and foremost, a type of fraud, uh, commingling of assets, using the same bank account for your personal and business needs, uh, undercapitalization, withdrawing money from that bank account so the corporation will be unable to pay its debts and its torts, and oddly failure to follow corporate formalities, maybe kind of a quid pro quo, tit for tat, that says if you don't follow formalities, you don't get protection. The case of C3 brought up one additional factor, which had to do with this concept of equitable ownership. And C3 really mostly stood for the idea that you don't have to be a shareholder to be an owner. Uh, this case had a complicated structure. I mapped it out on the board. I invite you to go back and kind of map it out or look at your notes there. Because what was going on was this, this, uh, uh, this grad student from Columbia developed some really great IP and he wanted to license it from Columbia and for reasons that don't make any sense to me. Columbia wouldn't license it to him, but only to a corporation not owned by him. And so he created this too clever by half scheme where he was able to, yeah, he was an independent contractor to a corporation and his independent contractor agreement gave him a, a right to purchase the entire shares for a thousand bucks at any time. And he ran the company as if it was owned. And so and go look at those facts, and you will see how the doctrine of equitable ownership created a, uh, essentially an ownership right in him and then allowed piercing to him. And uh, he was, in fact, treating the corporation as his own. And so that applies generally to all of our piercing cases. Uh, you don't have to be a shareholder. Uh, C3 showed a case where someone was not technically a shareholder but still could be liable under veil piercing theory. The other cases that we saw were a little more specific, and we had two additional ones that had to do specifically with piercing for 
torts. Veil piercing or shareholder liability for torts where a corporation and its actors wrongfully injure uh, a person uh, or property uh, was first brought up in the case of Wolkowski. And Wolkowski owned a number of cab companies. And actually two doctrines were brought up in this case. The first notion was that a plaintiff was run down by a taxi cab and injured. And the taxi cab had exactly the minimum amount of insurance, no more and no less than the minimum. And so the plaintiff claimed that it was undercapitalized because it was in fact unable to pay for the harm. The harm was much greater than the amount of insurance that was carried. I think it was something like $20,000 of insurance could have been $300,000 of harm. And so the plaintiff walked away, and this is what we called last semester, we talked about externalization of risk. And it seems a bit unfair that you could be hit by a taxi cab and they can walk away, or, well, drive away, and you can't walk anywhere because they just broke your leg. And so when does the taxi cab company have to pay? When, in fact, does the taxi cab owner have to pay? That was the question here. Well, the first question is, was Wolkowski treating the taxi cab company as his alter ego. And no, he wasn't. He simply had a number of cab companies who was operating them in the normal fashion. Now remember, in this case, there's also a horizontal theory, an enterprise liability theory, where the plaintiff wanted to pierce all, I think he had 10 companies, and collect from all 10 of the corporations, uh, stating that they were really one and the same company, but they had separate bank accounts, they had separate cabs, they had uh, some separate uh, 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 corporate status, and as a result, the piercing claim failed. And the court said, which I think is right, if you don't like the rule, go back to the legislature that made it. It's not the role of the courts to rewrite a bad law about how much liability taxi cabs should have. That's the role of the legislature. And in fact, the legislature did rewrite that law. Right? But the right place for that to happen is in the legislature, not in the courthouse. The courthouse here, I think, came out the right way. Uh, unfortunately for Wolkowski, but you know, the, tell your local uh, congressperson. Uh, Radzwecki was a similar case, uh, which also had to do with alter ego theory. There's a person who was hit by a truck on a motorcycle, badly injured, and the case here had a little bit more complicated facts uh, because uh, the, uh, the, the truck that hit him uh, was uh, owned by a company that was owned by another corporate parent. So the question here was, can we pierce to a corporate parent as opposed to an individual? And as uh, probably you won't be surprised, the, the outcome was the same. We have the same analysis. It wasn't run as an alter ego. It was run as an ordinary subsidiary. There was one wrinkle. The parent also owned the insurance company that had insured the sub that had run the truck. And that insurance company went bankrupt. And so there's some allegations that there was some funny business. But apparently that didn't hold water because why in the world would you take out insurance with a company that will go bankrupt. You're still paying your premiums and you get nothing at the end. It just doesn't make sense and there is no uh, uh, claim that they were being operated as a single entity. And so again, the claim fails. And it actually brings up the broader point that you might think that tort cases you pierce more often uh, because tort claimants are involuntary. No one wants to be hit by a cement truck. No one wants to be run over by a taxi cab. And so why should those people be left holding the bag, so to speak? Why should the risk of corporations be externalized on them? It's a little curious why that would be the case uh, as opposed to in contracts cases, but we do find that in contracts cases, courts, at least until recently, seem to have been at least as likely or more likely to pierce. So let's talk about one of those cases. Uh, the Burge or The Burge was a case of uh, property ownership. And so a piece of property was transferred a number of times. And uh, along with it was uh, assumed a note, an amount that needed to be paid. And uh, the property ended up going under, and the note was never paid. And so the people that were uh, owed under the note went against the company's owners and said, you paid the note, uh, of Smalls. And uh, while the Smalls had engaged in some shrewd dealing and sharp business practices, once again, they had set up a separate entity. They had, in fact, not only funded it, not, it was not underfunded, but they had contributed $250,000 to try to keep it afloat. It failed regardless, and we're not going to hold the Smalls liable. Once again, we do not pierce. So the only time we've seen so far that we pierce is where we've got this C3 computing guy who had a too clever by half scheme that made it look like he wasn't even a shareholder when really he was running the company as his own private show and as 
if you got into the facts a little farther in C3, he ended up taking one of the corporation's biggest opportunities and working for one of their major suppliers. So that was a huge problem as well. Maybe he was usurping corporate opportunities, but we see that bad actor feature predominant in these tort cases. Finally, we have our piercing in corporate groups. We had the very sad case of Weston where a guest went swimming at Lover's Beach, which turns out to be deadly and had horrible undertow. And he was crashed on the rocks and killed during a honeymoon. It was a tragic scene. But for whatever reason, the plaintiff's attorney, maybe not wanting to sue in Mexico, uh, where this, where this tort, uh, tort occurred, uh, tried to sue the owner of the Mexico hotel, which was uh, Weston International, and wanted to commence that suit in America. Maybe American juries are more favorable. In any event, the uh, argument there was that this was the alter ego, but that made no sense at all. In fact, these two hotels had different staff, different locations, different operating manuals, uh, different, absolutely different bank accounts, different real estate. One was involved in several other things. There was simply nothing there except the ordinary parent-subsidiary relationship. And of course, that claim failed because if it succeeded, every time the parents wouldn't have subsidiaries to limit their liability. It just wouldn't work. So that was sort of our classic case. And we contrast it with the case of Blimpy. Now, Blimpy was kind of a goofy one because now we have a corporation which is running a subsidiary as its alter ego. We have uh, uh, Blimpy International and, and then this uh, other corporation which has a very similar name uh, like BLP or, or, or Blimpy Co. And <clears throat> basically this other corporation has no separate offices, has no separate employees, and sends Blimpy employees out to, to malls and things to rent space. And they're wearing Blimpy logos, Blimpy hats on their shirt, you know. Blimpy guys come in, leading other people to believe that they actually are Blimpy. The address would lead them to believe that. And the only reason this subsidiary existed was because what they wanted to do was get these leases, assign them, not even sublease them and keep the liability, but, uh, but uh, assign them then away to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, sorry, they were, they were subleased because these were not assignable. And so the mall owners wanted Blimpy to be liable if the, franchisees didn't pay, but Blimpy wanted to give its franchisees cheap deals, and Blimpy being a big corporation could get a better deal than the franchisees could. And so it would sublease to franchisees and led the malls to believe that Blimpy, as a major corporation, would be liable. But in fact, uh, when the franchisees failed to pay, uh, the subleases failed to pay, the leasee Blimpy sub also failed to pay, refused to pay, and here the court finally we see pierced. And the court pierced to the parent corporation for the debts of the subsidiary because they were running the subsidiary as their alter ego. There is no uh, material difference between the companies. And so there we see that there are some limits to limited liability, and there are those limits to limited liability are where essentially a shareholder is treating a corporation as its alter ego and where there are the factors of misrepresentation, commingling assets, undercapitalization, and failure to follow formalities. Yeah, Lee. Um, so is equitable ownership a separate doctrine basically for um, corporations that are piercing corporate veils? Like, is it like a separate The equitable ownership doctrine is a separate doctrine from alter ego. And in the case of C3, the court needed both doctrines to get to the geek, the computer geek. Because he wasn't really a shareholder, so we're not piercing to the owner. We had to first find that he was an owner. But the sim similar facts came together. I mean, he was playing games. He was playing, I'm, not, I'm an independent contractor, blah, 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 where he was, an I mean, he was more than an employee. He was a super employee, owner, the sole person, the only reason the company existed. The whole thing was a scam, uh, a fraud. Uh, he misled people. And so this, while the doctrines are separate, the same facts led the court to find the alter ego and to find that he was the equitable owner. And therefore, piercing to him was appropriate. So we have piercing in two of our six cases. Then we moved on to securities markets. And we talked about our third and final form of liability, which is securities liability. So we have three things on the table today and this year, director liability, shareholder liability, securities liability. We began our discussion with the Securities Act of 1933, which came about after the Great Depression. And the Great Depression was blamed 
rightly or wrongly, on the sale of unregistered, uh, there was no registration, but the sale of securities to, to the proverbial widows and orphans, to vulnerable people in society who were not able to judge for themselves whether these investments were good or bad. The Brandeisian thinking of uh, sunlight is the best uh, uh, disinfectant, electric light, the best policeman, got it right that time, I think, uh, uh, was, uh, was applied in, in the crafting of the 33 Act, which created an elaborate set of disclosure requirements if you were to sell securities. Uh, of course, we talked about reasons why those may or may not truly protect people, but in any event, liability attaches for uh, a, 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 under the 33 Act for a, a selling of security uh, without registration. However, we also learned that there are a number of exemptions from registration, and so uh, private offerings was a major theme here because uh, issuing securities without registering, huge problem. Um, this becomes more interesting when you're dealing with novel things and then you apply something called the Howey test to see if something is or is not a security. Uh, stock is always a security, you can count on that. So by the way, don't sell stock without registering it or finding an exemption. So I'll try this at home, uh, but uh, uh, you know, you might sell other things, and the Howey case was a sale of land that also had a sale of services. We talked about Howey a fair bit, and that was found to be an investment contract, and that was done without registration. Again, another too clever by half scheme. But uh, one of the games uh, lawyers play, oh, the games lawyers play with securities laws is to find an exemption. It's my favorite game in the law. Find, find the exemption. And, and Regulation D has been a huge vehicle for venture capital financing because it is an exemption to the registration requirement if you're selling to certain persons. And there are two main aspects of, of Reg D, and one of those has two parts. By the way, Rule 505, which is in your book, has been struck out. Right, so you can strike that out in your book. So don't worry about 505. It doesn't exist. Why not? It had a $5 million limit. Rule 504 now has the $5 million limit. Rule 504 says you can sell to, uh, essentially you can sell $5 million in a 12-month period. Uh, long story short, to people involved with the company, and this can also include, in many cases, uh, grandma, and so you can sell to grandma when you're starting your own firm, but not unaffiliated people. Now, it doesn't matter here if they're sophisticated accredited. But there's not a lot of money in that. I mean, five million bucks is not a lot in the whole scheme of things in terms of capital formation, and grandma's not that rich, at least mine isn't, and so we need to go somewhere else. We need to go to the professionals, the proverbial big boys and girls, although honestly only about 7% are women, so maybe I'm not misspeaking to say the proverbial big boys in terms of venture capital investment. And, um, and so the venture capital community, which is located predominantly in Silicon Valley, but also has pockets throughout the country, second most would probably be New York City, and then you've got a smattering across the rest uh, of the states in our second tier areas. We have a very fine, actually, and, and I will mention diversity-focused uh, investor here called Innovation Works. They put on a lot of really excellent programming, trying to really help women and minorities access capital. It's excellent programming. And for those of you who are interested in following up, Ilana Diamond uh, runs that, and she's really uh, an amazing person. And so put that in your, in your, in your long-term thinking. Uh, we do have that in Pittsburgh, and it's an amazing feature of our community. But in any event, uh, all of those venture capitalists are operating under uh, Reg D Rule 506 and mostly Rule 506B. That is a safe harbor. And that safe harbor exemption says that so long as a company does not generally solicit, does not advertise its sale of securities in a public way, like putting it out in the newspaper, or more modernly, going on a website and making these offerings, but going door to door, knocking on the VCs, going up and down Sand Hill Road, talking to Benchmere, talking to uh, 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 A16Z, talking to all the VCs uh, in that area, and saying, would you like to buy my stock? Well, so long as the investor is accredited, which is a, a proxy for sophistication, accredited to someone who has a million dollars in net worth, not including their house, and, or $200,000 a year net income, 300000 jointly if they're married, uh, counts as accredited, we presume they're sophisticated, we allow them to lose their shirt if they choose to. Uh, it's a sharp cutoff. It's kind of a weird rule. The, the number amount, the dollar amount hasn't changed since 1982, 1984. Obviously, inflation has. Uh, so, you know, that's sort of a little background to it. Um, but that's been a huge driver uh, in terms of financing. However, Rule 506C, which came out as part of the Jobs Act, the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act of 2012, may be even more powerful, and that allows a company to generally solicit. 
And so you have websites like angel.co, something called AngelList, where you can go online and see offerings and people like Aston Kutcher using their celebrity status to pump companies. I say pump and I mean that, so be careful of pump and dump, be careful of, be careful of investing with Ashton, uh, even if you are accredited. But essentially these portals are, are walled gardens, they'll only admit accredited into the walled garden where you're allowed to lose your shirt if you so choose. And, uh, and so we have to take these reasonable steps to verify their credit, but then we can actually advertise to them in, in a general way. And this is bringing a whole new vibrancy uh, to the market. There's also, by the way, Regulation A+, uh, which is a mini IPO. Uh, it probably will not be on, on the bar anytime soon, but for those of you who are interested, we can chat about that. It actually is seeming to be a, a kind of, it's a quasi-crowdfunding. And then we have Regulation Crowdfunding. I've written about that a fair bit. It doesn't work very well because it's expensive and has a million dollar limit. But let's see what happens in the future. And by the way, if you're in the building tomorrow, uh, I'm hosting a webinar uh, watching party. There'll be pizza. Uh, and so we're going to watch a, um, uh, an approximately 45 minute to an hour long webinar hosted by the Heritage Foundation on the Crowdfunding Act, uh, uh, which is Title III of the Jumpstart Business Startups Act and the regulations they're under and then afterwards have pizza and a discussion about where crowdfunding is going. So if you're interested in that, uh, it's tomorrow at noon in room 310. Uh, and so that's the Crowdfunding Act, and those are kind of, that sort of rounds out our, our exceptions. And so again, the major exception uh, historically to the 1933 Act was Reg D, Rule 506B, which said you can sell to unlimited accredited and up to 35 non-accredited, so long as you don't generally solicit. Reg uh, D, Rule 506C, uh, has modernized that and allows us to solicit, but you cannot sell to any non-accredited and you have more obligation to verify that they're for real. Rule 504 was beefed up, so we can now take $5 million of grandma's money, not just $1 million of grandma's money. So that does help companies that are small and getting started get that friends and family round uh, that may make more sense with modern capital formation. Reg CF, or regulation crowdfunding, has a million dollar limit and costs about $100,000 upfront to do. <coughs> so it's not working out so great, but we'll see what happens and we'll talk about that tomorrow. And then regulation A, which has been updated and is colloquially called regulation A plus, allows raising of either 25 million or 50 million, depending on whether you want to submit to audited financials on an ongoing basis in something that looks a lot like a mini IPO or an IPO light. So that's all the ways you can issue securities or you can register. Uh, now, whatever you do, whether you're registered or not, what, if you're reselling, anyone who's selling securities will be subject to securities fraud liability under the uh, Securities Exchange Act. The first act pertained to the securities, now we're talking about the exchange of them, so the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. And 10b says, it shall be unlawful for any person to use or employ in connection with the sale or purchase of any security, any manipulative or deceptive device or contrivance in contravention of such rules and regulations as the commission may prescribe. So 10b of the 1934 Securities Exchange Act sets this general principle and uh, the SEC did answer the call and promulgated rules. They love promulgating rules. They're never less than 200 pages. Uh, and all and, uh, well, the old ones used to be. Now there's hundreds, hundreds of pages of rules. They're, they're great at generating uh, uh, paper. Anyway, Rule 10b-5 uh, is a rule that uh, the SEC generated about employment of manipulative and, and deceptive devices. And it says, essentially, and it shall be unlawful for a person to, to defraud uh, by use of the mails or interstate commerce. This has to do with the interstate commerce clause. It's how we get federal jurisdiction over these issues. By the way, everything involves the mails, so you know, that helps. I guess you know, even phone lines and things, so they're connected. And essentially, it means that you cannot make false statements but it does not preclude you from making omissions. It gets a little tricky because sometimes a omission makes a statement false and so you have to be quite careful, but it does pertain to statements and it also pertains to sellers, people who have sold securities. It does not pertain to people that did not buy because of a misstatement. So that's actually a, a good thing to, to note and to not get tripped up on. Who can use this act? Either the SEC can make an enforcement action or someone who bought or sold a security uh, on reliance of a material misstatement. We'll go through the elements in a minute, uh, but not someone who did not buy or sell because of a material 
misstatements. So what are the elements of a fraud claim? Four elements to a fraud claim. One, we have to show that the corporation or the person uh, selling, uh, a purchaser or a seller rather, but a transacting party makes materially false and misleading statements. So an actual statement that is not in fact true. Uh, false and misleading. Uh, two, with the intention to deceive, that's the scienter element. Uh, uh, three, reliance upon which the plaintiff relies. And four, causation causing loss to the plaintiff. Sounds a lot like duty breach caused damages, uh, but uh, in any event, let's talk a little bit more specifically about that. And so briefly to review it, we have a couple additional statutory requirements that were put in place by the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. First, under Section uh, 21DA3, uh, uh, these are generally class actions. Who can be the lead plaintiff? It used to be that the lead plaintiff was basically first to file, first and right, first in time. This is not property class, so that didn't work so well. Instead, we have the lead plaintiff be the investor who has the largest financial stake and therefore should be able to best represent the class. Two, uh, or uh, to, uh, 21 B, uh, DB2, the complaint has a heightened fraud pleading requirement. You know, think back to Civ Pro, Twombly, Iqbal, Iqbal, blah, blah, blah. The complaint must state with particularity facts that give rise to a strong inference that a defendant acted with the required state of mind. Can you imagine how hard it is to get information that someone had a, an, a rotten, evil state of mind when they did something? And you're a shareholder and they're a director of a corporation or, you know, it's very hard to know that. And so where do they get that information? This is one of the reasons why the SEC brings these actions. They have a whistleblower hotline. They get tips. They might have that information based on tips they receive from whistleblowers. Uh, but that is a high bar. The pleading requirements are a high bar. Uh, the materiality standard in 21EC1A little one, I said there's a lot of, as you see, loves their rules. Uh, Forward-looking statements that are identified as such uh, uh, and accompanied by meaningful and cautionary statements are not actionable. And so essentially companies can disclaim that good things will happen in the future. They can say, look, we're going to, uh, we hope that this will happen, but it probably won't. And what you find is that companies do produce these elaborate risk disclosures and they'll tell you that everything in the world is going to go wrong. You'd be a fool to buy this. And, uh, and, and in fact, you, you might be, uh, but th those are functional. Uh, the complaint must uh, allege statements that omit material information, uh, uh, that is, the complaint uh, uh, can, can capture uh, omissions when those omissions would be necessary to clarify a statement that was made. And so if a statement uh, is misleading because additional information was not provided, that omission can come in. The science or element is that the, the plaintiff must, for every false or misleading statement, state with particularity, uh, facts giving rise that the defendant acted with a culpable state of mind. How culpable? Courts are a couple ways about this, but let's say gross negligence for our purposes here, something more than simply negligent, but had the, had the knowledge that the statement would mislead, had the intention, not maybe not quite intentionality, but knew or should have known that providing this information would mislead a person into making uh, a buy or sell decision uh, that was not based on, on uh, facts. And then causation, the plaintiff has the burden of proving the misleading statement caused the plaintiff's loss, but in general, if the misleading statement uh, is correlated with the price of the stock going down, it's often not that hard to prove. And so that wraps up our discussion on securities fraud. And so keep those four elements in mind because that's really the main of what you'll be asked here. Uh, of course, we'd go much, much, much deeper in a securities regulation course, but focus on 10b-5 and the, uh, and the registration exemptions. I think you'll have what you need for corporations. So any questions? Yes, Lee. Yes. Yes. The credit, the uh, credit investor has to have one million dollars in total net worth, not including their primary residence, or two hundred thousand dollars in income if they're single, three hundred thousand if they're married filing jointly. <laughs> 
And then you're sophisticated. Because everyone with a million bucks is totally smart, right? Well, it's a proxy, I guess. Not all proxies are accurate. That's what we got. Other questions? So just, just to clarify, because my brain hurts. If you have a million dollars in total network, you would assume to be sophisticated? Yeah, well, there, there used to be a test for sophistication. It was replaced by the test of something called accreditation. We don't really care if you're smart. We figure that if you have a million bucks, you're either smart or can afford to lose your money. <laughs> but all you need to know is that we sell under 506B and C to accredited. Yeah. There's no 2 million part. Oh, 200,000 200, income. Yeah. Right? That's that's an alternative to having a million dollars in net worth. Not including your primary residence. And that's 300,000 of income if you're married, and I believe it's if you're married filing jointly, but don't quote me on that. Well, I mean, do quote me on that, and if that's what you put in the exam, I won't work. But. So again, uh, I hope the exam is helpful to you in your overall preparation for the bar and your consideration of engagement in corporate issues. And I just want to take the opportunity to say it's, it's really a pleasure to have taught all of you for a year. It's great. I love the, I love the fact that the course goes on over a period of time. And, um, and uh, you know, it's just been great to get to know some of you, to work with some of you on papers and to, to meet with you and to hopefully get you involved in some of the upper level courses that we're offering. Uh, I think we're offering some great stuff. Uh, we're offering more and more in the corporate area. And we're really seeing opportunities for job creation there. Um, you know, my venture capital law class tomorrow is having our final meeting at Cohen Law Firm. Uh, we met at uh, Cohen and Grigsby uh, previously, uh, at uh, Reed Smith, uh, rather. Uh, 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 we had um, managing partners come to the classroom. And so I hope you consider that as if you're interested in corporate, because uh, we really have an underserved community here in terms of corporate uh, talent. And the firms realize it, the startups realize it. And so it's a growing area. So if you found these topics interesting, if you really don't want to wear a suit every day, trust me, I don't either. But you just, you just kind of want to go to your office and, and do your job and not have to run down to the courthouse and have a judge yell at you. You'd rather have your client yell at you. Or if you just like working on projects that feel maybe productive in the sense that everybody wins, like you're dealing with deals and it's sort of a win-win situation, not a zero-sum game, uh, corporate law really might be for you. And um, you get to apply economic thinking, some business acumen, get to work closely with business people, and they're different than lawyers. You get, you know, kind of, <laughs> I don't know if you've been in the building too long, you might, you might get a kind of a myopic view of how people view the world. But in any event, it's been a real pleasure to, to offer this course to you. I hope you've enjoyed it, and thanks. So have a good night.